Cyber Salon, our series about the Internet Big Bang. We're looking at the early Internet and the key people who created it, the key people who made it happen, and what do they think about what's the, what's the reflection on it today. So I'm really delighted today to have John Baines with us. John was one of the absolute movers and shakers of this early period. Uh, so John, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm John Baines. I, um, I guess in Web, Web University, I started out in 1994, end of. Um, but yeah, my background is um, I'm an American for my sins, American. Um, but I actually grew up in Scotland. Uh, so where I lived for 20 odd years. I ended up falling into the web universe because of um, publishing a fanzine in Scotland called Convulsion, which um, I decided to do instead of my degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. So I- uh, Were you at uh, Edinburgh University? I was at, I was at Edinburgh day doing AI. Yeah. And I, I, we must have missed each other in the gate somewhere because I was doing my PhD in uh, Burbank, uh, uh, allied to UCL. Right. And we were constantly going to Edinburgh because they had this connection to Stanford. Yeah. And they had the best uh, computer user interface and AI research. So I was on a train up and down all the time in 92, 93. I'm sure we bumped into each other somewhere. Yeah, m must have. I mean, there, were, there was a real competition actually between Edinburgh University and Harriet Watt because Harriet Watt was doing all the HCI stuff and Edinburgh basically owned AI. Um, you know, they, they had their own version of Prologue, Edinburgh Prologue. Um, and, um, and then the AI department burned down. <laughs> there, was a big, there was a big fire. It wasn't you, I hope. It wasn't you. No, but it, but it, was, quite, it was quite dramatic. I mean, it, it was a massive fire that... Uh, took out a whole area of, of quite in, right near the um, Royal Mile. Um, and that included taking taking out, um, is it Forest Hill, Forest House? But the internet was basically born as Phoenix out of the ashes of Edinburgh AI. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I got my first net connection in 94. And um, uh, I was one of the, the first people to sign up for Demon Internet. As, as oh, my, yeah, sorry, I'm, sorry, I wasn't on EasyNet, but uh, no, you were too techy for EasyNet. EasyNet was for normal people. So uh, what was your first computer? What what was your first home computer? Oh, well, first home computer was a Spectrum 16K. Um, and then um, I went to Commodore 128, which I saved up my pennies for. So, uh, and then an Amiga 500, then an Amiga 3000. Um, basically, I went down the Amiga thing. But all the, all the while, I was actually a Mac geek. So my, my physics teacher used to have a Mac, which I borrowed. Uh, one of the original macro pluses and he, he lived just up the road so I'd, go, I'd just go up and sort of bring it down so sort of doing desktop publishing stuff okay that's amazing sure. so uh, yeah i had a route via commodore 64 mm. uh, it was slightly different because i was in poland when it all started so we were very much into basic we didn't really even see a mac till probably 92 so yeah different but the advantage was that because we were in kokom area we couldn't buy the up-to-date computers, so everybody was making their own. So I was quite used to seeing, you know, how finished computers with guts filling out and people just filling with it. I wish our kids could do that because it's like, you know, you don't worry about it, you can know what's inside. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit sad, actually, with the ras things like the Raspberry Pi and, the, and Arduinos, and you've got this amazing kit that you can actually do with. Yeah, so we will come back to that because that's on my list. So. So when you so when I met you, you were already in London. So what what brought you down from the Great Scotland? Well, it's quite interesting actually. I mean, it relates to the fanzine. So I um, I was sending out I think the fourth issue of it um, to various record companies to get advertising. And one of the the you know I was twenty two I think at the time, very young, uh, twenty two twenty three. And I one of the people I sent it to was. Um, or one of the companies I sent to was Southern Records. Um, and the person I sent it to passed it on to the guy who ran the, the record company, this guy called John Loder. And John Loder was the um, was originally the manager of the, the punk band Crass. Southern Records did uh, lots of labels like uh, Discord Records, at Fugazi and um, Touch and Go, uh, Jesus Lizard, and also lots of punk stuff. But they also, um, distributed through their distribution company all of the original jungle stuff right so all, all 
you know, all the Goldie and all that lot was actually all through SRD. And he um, he was geek. I mean, he was a full on proper uh, like Unix geek. And uh, he saw that I'd written a couple of pieces about the web. Right. And um, was looking for somebody who could uh, had some editorial skills, <laughs> had some design skills and had some web skills. And at that point, I'd, I'd built my first couple of websites on Mosaic, um, you know, aligned left. And um, so he asked me to come down to help set up um, the European arm, what was called the Internet Underground Music Archive, IUMA, which was set up by... Sadly, I can only remember John Luini, who I'm still in touch with, but I think it's John and Rob or something. Um, and Ayuma was really interesting. It was a, an early precursor to things like mp3.com, you know, when it was mp2s, and it was a way of discovering, um, you know, independent bands. Uh, a bit, and this was before there were really mp3 players. So it was really, really cutting edge. And uh, my first day actually on the job was going on MTV. To talk about, to talk that was about. quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, it was first day on the job. It was, it was, a, a, in a, day. Yeah, yeah. It was a little bit like with us in Siberia. You know, we opened in September the Cyber Cafe, and I think by October I was on the front page of Vogue <laughs> without actually having to do anything. Uh, the gag, so, the, so you uh, came at it from music, right? So your connection was from music. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, it's fanzines. Um, a lot of the first um, sites I did were artist sites and label sites. Um, our connection, by the way, is through the fanzine, bizarrely, is that my uh, scene was distributed by um, a tiny little distributor called AK Press, uh, which, was from, um, sent, which was in Edinburgh. Um, and it was the same people who distributed 3W magazine. So I basically stole copies of um, Ivan Pope's World Wide Web fanzine, right, and was sort of reading this. So even though I'd never met Ivan, right, we were actually being distributed by the same folks. So when it first came to London, he was one of the first people who looked up and that's basically was my first trip to Siberia. Ah, oh, right, because Ivan was my uh, neighbor. We invited them to take sub-Siberia. So I actually have the picture of it, but before we moved in, we didn't know really what to do with that space. And it was a beautiful space with this arches uh, from an old uh, wine cellar. So it was a stunning place just underneath Siberia. And I, Ivan Pope with Steve Bobrick set up the web media there. And we were just feeding them pizzas and they were typing and creating web pages because suddenly everybody wanted a web page. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was all a bit nuts. I mean, the, um, but yeah, so I was, I was at Southern for a few months. Um, uh, it's, and my office was the live room of their studio, so I'd get kicked out for PJ Harvey and people like that who just come and record albums there. And and, and uh, it was all it was a very surreal period of time. <laughs> but what, the musicians were early on the internet. We were quite well, lucky because we had the Siberia recording studio next door. Well, so when, we were getting musicians coming through the door all the time. Well, when it, I mean, my job, my job. It was to go and talk to bands and labels and say, I'll do your website for free. And it was it was really interesting. So this is like end of 94. And I thought, well, I'll go and talk to all the people I know that do techno, right? And electronic stuff because, you know, they're geeky, the web's geeky. And um, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of the bands I spoke to were incredibly dull. They just had nothing interesting to say. And, and they, you know, they were fantastic making music. But they, they had no real, you know, they no commentary. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. I used to go out with a punk boy from LA uh, back in the 90s from a, a very fun band called the Youth Brigade. Oh, and yeah. Most energetic, amazing music. But oh my God, these guys were so boring. I left him very quickly after. <laughs> it, was, it was really grim. So I, I, I started talking to the uh, to punk and indie labels. So we ended up. I ended up doing the website for like um, alternative tentacles and um, various ones around Southern. And it's just the bands were, you know. Were you a club boy? Did you actually go clubbing or was, was it more well, reflective well, listening? Well, clubbing, clubbing was absolutely key. You wouldn't have obsolete if, you, if I didn't go clubbing.
So the key person that I met in that period um, was clubbing. Uh, I used to go on Thursday nights to heaven where there was a club called Mega Triplis. Yeah, yeah, we were providing the ISDN. Yeah. And it was meeting, um, well, two folk really, Martin Kavanaugh, who ran the, I think called the Virtuality Room, which... Um, which was just this tiny little enclave whilst everybody's sort of tripping off their nuts, um, <laughs> um, of techies. And um, so I used to go there every week. Um, and met lots of people, one of the, the main people I met. And we just immediately hit off as a guy called Matt Black, who, um, who had a band called Cold Cut and a record label called Ninja Two. And we, we kind of immediately got on because he was a geek and I didn't know who he was. Everybody else was sort of, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. This is the guy who wrote Pump Up the Volume, right? And I didn't know that, right? He's the guy who wrote The Only Way Is Up for, for Yaz. Right? And I, I don't know anything about him. I just know he's a geek. And um, so we um, so we got talking a lot. He introduced me to the, the people I then end up doing Obsolete with, you know? All oh, right. That's amazing. I didn't know that because uh, we worked very closely with Martin Kavanagh on... Uh the providing of ISDN connections to the clubs and to the raves outside with generators. Because remember in 1994, it was uh, November mm. when John Major banned raves. <laughs> Uh, which basically banned music, <coughs> but loud music. And I just thought it was so ridiculous. I was so incensed about it that we discussed it with our co Siberia co-founders and we decided, you know, that was going to be our political mission. We were not particularly political at that time. We were more in it for art and fun, but that was so annoying. So we met with Martin and then uh, connected Heaven and Megatropolis to ISD, by ISDN with the American clubs. <laughs> So Martin was really, I think he brought the idea uh, of a festival into the clubs in the first place. That was his, he was the key person. And then he brought the technology. So he like a double. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, around. he's still around, if we should meet up because you know, he's such a yeah, I mean, he, 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 he was amazing. And um, he is like, you know, one of the, one of the, these key nexus points introducers. <laughs> Parliament, the seat of government, the voice of the majority. But not a mile away is a centre where a vocal minority believe the system is collapsing. Leaving behind the traditional values of money, job and security, they're planning a new society which they call the future perfect state. The Megatropolis Club Night is the latest backlash against consumer society. Um, and and so hanging out there was quite cool because um, everybody wanted to talk to me, um, not because I was particularly nice or intelligent or anything, but I had a server. <laughs> we, we were we were sponsored. Ayuma was sponsored by Silicon Graphics, so I had an Indigo um, to run all this stuff off of, um, which at that point was incredibly rare. I mean, it was on a it was on a you know a, I think it was a two megabit line, which at the time was unheard of. Um, so I, I actually- Were you based in ICA? Because Sun had this little kind of like a glass room in ICA. No, we, we, funnily enough, we ended up doing the ICA website um, when they when they were doing the thing with Silicon Graphics. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but no, it was, um, 
I was I, I was actually um, based in uh, Wood Green, which in which is where Southern was, and John Loder had put in ridiculous a ridiculous pipe into into this recording studio. You know? That's amazing because that was a better pipe that we had from EasyNet. So at that time, you know, we were doing the EasyNet. So we thought we were bees knees, but you know, we didn't have that yeah. kind of pipe. But we did have a residency when we found the cyber salon out of Sabira in 97, we had the residency with, um, I think with Ivan in mm. uh, ICA and the uh, Sun and Silicon Graphics were there providing the main tech. And mm. uh, I remember, I think at that time you were doing your first launches, there was some launch there that we bumped into each other, but ICA was kind of at the core of it. And Kodo, Kodwo Eshon, who came down from Warwick, he yeah. was the kind of intellectual. We were the, the techies, we were doing the doing, and he was doing all the thinking. <laughs> Yeah, the, I, I have to say the ICA was absolutely pivotal as well because that, that had um, on Tuesday nights uh, Robin Ram, Rimbo yeah. scanner had his um, electronic lounge and the you know the people I didn't meet at Mega Triplets I met. At, either at the Electronic Lounge or at um, Talvin Singh's club a bit later on, Anoka, right, um, which is in um, Shoreditch in uh, Old Street. Uh, but yeah, so by it's, it's amazing how, how much happened in a short period of time. So I, I, I was approached by um, the BBC, by Radio 1, because they heard about this mad Scottish dude basically going into websites for bands. And um, I was asked to help out do the very first web website for Radio 1, and which, um, which we did. And that was kind of the first gig. I think the budget was three grand. Um, we moved into um, next door to Ninja Tune on London Bridge uh, and, and Clink Street. And that was your first business or were you still freelancing? Um, that was that was my first thing. I, I, I mean, I was, only, I was only actually at Southern for about three months um, uh, before leaving to do my own thing. I've never really had any, never really did jobs per se. So this was, <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we started, uh, started obsolete basically with a, you know, a few things happened in between. And we used uh, BBC money taxpayers money to fund Jones and Pye, excellent. That's the yeah, well, we, we got money off of them. We did uh, the, the website for the Net TV show on BBC Two with um, Illuminations, John Wyvers crew. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the BBC was actually quite, quite key. Um, I and with... Because at that, that time I was doing a competing program with the Net called the Net as well, uh, but it was done by Granada TV. Uh, with uh, Tony Wilson, who was the you know mover and shaker in Hacienda in Manchester, mm -hmm. uh, I was hoping it up to Manchester every week for the filming and some ungodly hours in the morning. And then uh, Tony Wilson used to take us, because he was in his fifties then, you know, he was made, he was like the god. He used to take us in his white Rolls Royce to cruise around Manchester and get the show of all the clubs. And oh my God, I remember getting so wasted there, it was insane. But he really drove the uptake of internet up north because he basically said, He's, to them, this is important, you, you are doing it. So again, music. Yeah, Tony, up I mean, Tony was amazing, absolutely amazing. And he then uh, helped us to set up Siberia Manchester, right. which then bounced me up to Edinburgh. So when you came down, we sort of went up. You're going up. Siberia Manchester. I mean, right, it was, so it, it, the obsolete happened kind of out of out of your BBC initial. Well, it was, it was their cash. I mean, it was we had um, you know it was doing doing lots of record labels and stuff. We did we did um, it was um, I think um, by the summer of ninety five we were about six or seven people. So um, and a lot of music, but the thing is, the music stuff didn't pay. <laughs> but, uh, no, no cash. Um, and we were doing Levi's, and Le Levi's was a big, big one. How did it come about? Because there was, you were very early on, but there were other agencies, probably more established at the time, coming off art agencies, traditional but, art agencies. 
So I know I'm always amazed that you landed that Levi. Uh, yeah. We pitched. We pitched against two other agencies, but they were we were only, the only UK one. Okay. okay. Um, there was one one in Sweden and one in Belgium that we pitched against. It's amazing. I mean, you know, yeah. No, you were a total legend. I remember when we heard about it, we were just, oh my God, that's that's amazing because you know Levi didn't go around picking London agencies. That's for sure. <laughs> we were doing. I mean, yeah. So we. I can't even remember. I do remember turning up at Siberia absolutely trashed mm -hmm. after having been working for 24 hours um, on the Levi's pitch. Well, you did such a great job of it because, you know, at that time the web was so slow that you couldn't really do much, but you managed to squeeze every ounce of creativity out of the medium at that time. And yeah, deliver look, stuff that, to be honest, I don't think Levi has come up with any more cutting edge scenes. I have to say, the secret was um, I, I had the benefit of being a really, really bad designer. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't do color, so um, to me, low bandwidth was perfect. So just everything, uh, everything I loved doing was in black and white, or um, four bit, and um, we kind of locked out because we, you know, we, we were doing server push stuff quite early, early on, so we could animate things even before gifts. And um, and if you're used to it, if you're not worried about everything being pixelated, we, we I remember we were doing um, like video at two to four frames a second, right? And and it, and just like postage stamp stuff just blown up really big, and it looked fantastic. As long as you didn't really care what it, it actually amazing. was, it all looked amazing, particularly to us because you know we could. Uh, appreciate, you know, bank makers ourselves. I mean, I had Siberia web, but we could appreciate, you know, how much of incredible ingenuity went into mm. this early Levi's because everything else was just like, you know, slow-mo version of the universe. But some artists were, were doing it well as well. Do you remember Olya Lianina? <laughs> This very lovely um, piece on my boyfriend came from the war about her own boyfriend actually coming from Afghanistan and the whole embarrassment situation that she wasn't really in love with him anymore. So she did this piece in black and white with some animation and it was just so moving and so shocking. I remember crying over it. And you know, it was on the, I don't know, 14 BPS uh, modem, <laughs> but she did it. <coughs> no, it was, it, was, it was good fun. I mean, the other thing was the browsers were changing on a day by day basis, you know, to, so, you know, Netscape 1.1 was actually such a big deal because that, that had uh, tables, you know, and tables allowed you to do proper layout yeah. um, by Netscape 2, which was about 96. Um, that was starting to do JavaScript, wasn't it? Um, it was around, around then. But, yeah, uh, we, we at that time started moving into taking payments online because SSL has then established itself as yeah. a secure, secure socket layer, and we were just started taking the payments in Siberia online in the credit cards. And mm -hmm. I still remember people thinking, like, "Are you sure about it? Is that safe?" Yeah, go. <laughs> so that was obsolete, and you had some interesting crew that then yeah. moved with you to the new venture, right? Yeah, well, so so by um, obviously it lasted from ninety five to ninety seven. Um, during that time, um, James Stevens, who's one of the partners, founding partner, um, had set up Backspace, and which was, of course, direct kind of competition for you. Uh, being art, you know, Sarber Cafe Art Space, um, which made when there were two in London at the time. Um, and so his focus was more on that. Mine was, I liked in the commercial, commercial creative stuff. Um, so myself, Simon Crabb, David Jones, David Hart, um, and Bixen were all kind of the, the original, uh, the, oh, and Jill Maggard actually, um, the, the originals for, um, uh, lateral, you know, which we set up. So. And were you based in the same place or, or you moved? We moved, um, we stayed in um, the building in Clink Street, uh, Winchester Wharf, which was an amazing building. 
we, we, we absolutely loved out. We had Ninja Tune was there. There was Hydrogen Jukebox, um, the Big Chill was in there for a while. Audio, Audio Rom, not Anti Rom, Audio Rom yeah. uh, was in there. Um, Dave Harrow, who was, um, did James Hardway. There was flotation tanks on the ground floor. People who hated us because we made, we made too much noise. Um, and across the street, we had Medium Rare, uh, which is another digital agency. Um, and we, we, it was an amazing little street, actually. You know, it, it was just full of geeks and musicians and filmmakers and stuff. So, uh, and we were there till 2000 when they kicked everybody out of the building. Yeah, so. actually we, we were doing as a separate project, the uh, uh, Big Bang Internet Walks in London. So mm. we, we have to do that with you as well, because you know, that whole area of Shoreditch, uh, actually Wood Green as well, Islington, uh, you know, that's where it was at. I mean, Soho had Soho Net, uh, so they had the big bandwidth because of the um, CGI, the special effects companies wanted to connect to LA. So they had good connection, but Soho was so expensive that no internet company could ever afford it for about five years. So, so it wasn't really as the scene as people think. So we were in Petrovia, and Petrovia was cheaper, so people were around us. But then, you know, you crossed the Oxford Street and it was all, all agencies. So yes, yeah, so you were on my list for the walks. So you were kind of competing with people like uh, Antirom and Tomato. And no, the no, not really, not at that point. Um, Antirom were very much focused on um, uh, ROMs, simple as, uh, actually in 90, 95, 96, it wasn't until much later um, that they really got into doing web stuff. Uh, and Tomato was actually my inspiration for obsolete anyway, right? I mean, that, that I, I um, in '94 had come down early earlier that year. I'd come down and interviewed Carl Hyde, and we met in Tomato when they were on Darbley Street. And I thought, you know what? I would make the tea here, right? I think this is such an amazing environment, and I and I modeled. I know they were like rock stamps. Yeah, and I I just modeled what I imagined working in Tomato was like. So I don't I didn't, never saw them as competition, and they and they were actually friends from. Uh, I mean, I, I met Richard Barbrook. Um, on uh, at the end of 94 um, on Radio 5 doing an interview on Radio 5 when um, basically the interviewer asked me all the questions that were aimed at him because <laughs> uh, I was doing all this independent music stuff and he was he'd sold out with anti Rom and they were doing Virgin <laughs> so <laughs> got questions all completely wrong but I uh, think who was uh, who was kind of driving it. I worked a bit with this team. Do you remember Virtual Nightclub, which was a development, it was all up then. Yeah. And it wasn't, I can't remember what was it was. Was it Phillips? I thought it was yeah. Phillips. Um, it was Phillips, yeah. but I think they bought the project. But anyway, there was loads of money project, yeah. which was on the wrong platform because it wasn't transferable to the internet. So they were working, they spent like million dollar, million pounds. Mm. They woke up on the wrong platform. But while they were making it, uh, they were also just being generally amazing and driving everybody to think that this is going to be big and we have to think big and you have to spend big. And I nearly ran out of cash when I started thinking big. So <laughs> both, both James Stevens and Dave, David Jones worked on the virtual nightclub thing along with everyone else. Yeah, yeah it was huge. It was huge. There was hundreds of people involved. <laughs> a beautiful project and i think now you know when technology kind of caught up i mean we we see some of it in you know vr chat and some of it is 
is definitely coming back in virtual reality, but it just took a bit of time. Uh, but tell me about uh, Lateral. So that was a, that was a proper agency, right? So by then you were well, we, happy. Well, we set it up as limited company. That was helpful. <laughs> Obviously, it was actually set up as a partnership because they didn't know any better. Um, yeah, so so we continued doing Levi's. We started picking up um, more and more bigger clients. Um, and yeah, lost lost a fair amount of music stuff, although we did end up working with EMI for quite a few years, uh, doing Robbie Williams and Jerry Halliwell, um, wow. ver various <laughs> bits and bobs. By 99, we did the Blair Witch Project, so we were doing a lot of stuff with Pathé films. Um, but yeah, it was, it was um, we, were, we were going. I mean, by, by the time, I think mean, by 98, 99, we were about 20, 20 odd folk moved into a slightly bigger office in the same building. Yeah. And you had quite a few women there. I remember uh, Laura Bamba was on your... Yeah, Laura, Laura joined around 1999, 2000, I think. Yeah. But we, she came we, from Australia. I remember we worked with her a little bit before she joined you. And they had this Australian feminist movement there way before the techno feminists, way before we were into it. So I was always a feminist. I just didn't know a cyber feminist. <laughs> well, I, I, they were quite interesting sets of, you know, they were very radical. Yeah. We. I don't know whether we were progressive or or because uh, I was brought up in a single parent family by my mom as a feminist, but we, we were diverse by design. And so we, we always tried to have a, about 50 50 male female split um, uh, before there was she's and they's and all that. It's and, and, yeah, um, I remember coming to your office and you were, you know, you were very early on, really good mix, diverse. Yeah. Lots, and lots and, of feminists as well. And, Hardly anybody was from the UK, right? Yeah, and basically as international as we could get because um, we had people from all over the world. We ended up with quite a few Swedes because the Swedes were invading. But, um, you know. So you had Koreans and Japanese? It Italian, Spanish, German, um, the odd American, South American. Um, yeah, I always thought Chinese. that I wish they had the same in Siberia, and I always thought that it's because the locals were a bit dubious about, you know, is it going to be a career or is it going to be just a passing mm -hmm. path? And I think it took till after 2000 where good people from Cambridge started coming to the internet and actually taking internet jobs as opposed to going to the banks. Yeah, I want to think back though, and you know what, it, I don't think we were, um, we didn't plan it like that. We just, it just happened. liked hiring interesting folk and, and the, the monoculture wouldn't work for the work that we were doing. Uh, and because we were doing, you know, certainly having Levi's there the whole time, where we're, we're, we've got an intern, you know, we're doing the whole of Levi's Europe um, as well. So it, there was a couple of times it became really handy having native French, German, Spanish, and Italian speakers when we were doing having to do the translation. Um, yeah, and but, it was nice to, to see the output because it was, you know, it was world class output for sure. And it was very international. And at that time, UK, you know, I came in '86, and I remember going around London thinking like, what? No coffee shops, nowhere to sit down and have coffee. Everybody's drinking builders in Greasy Joe's. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so that was one of my uh, inspirations for Sabira to bring a bit of Europe into that because UK was quite isolated. It was quite sort of, you know, you felt it was an island. <clears throat> I think the channel, uh, uh, the tunnel across uh, to France was only just open in 94, 95. So we were really stuck on the island and also the economically I think the people were very downtrodden remember the unemployment in 97 was about 10 percent so there were no jobs unless you were in tech there were no jobs and uh, interest rates were about 15 percent so a lot of people had negative equity from the housing crash in 1987 which took very long time to work itself through so when we were we were kind of like a little pocket of excitement in the big sea of total disaster, particularly up north. I remember going to Manchester for Siberia and oh my God, nobody had a job. Like nobody in Manchester had a job. And I just thought, bloody hell, this is all people living on state support, but that's a lot of people. And the same in Birmingham, there was no work in Birmingham. So, so the whole cyber movement and techno culture was just landing on a very fertile ground because there was really nothing else going on, just us. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of it like that. I mean, be, partly because I never had a job. 
so uh, and I was used to right age, right? You are twenty three straight from college. Yeah. Um, and I'm just think, just thinking actually, ninety seven was you know when train spotting came out, and when and in, in us in moving down from Edinburgh, when that was the height, you know, so ninety four, you know, uh, you're talking about raves. It was it was things were, things were pretty scary actually um, in parts of Edinburgh. Yes, so I think, you know, I, I never thought about it till, till recently, but when I looked up the whole conversations about why John Major criminalized rapes, they were really worried. You know, Tories were really worried because there was this thousands and thousands of disenfranchised young people whose parents were the ones who bear the brunt of Thatcher unemployment strategy. Mm -hmm. So they were brought up in you know, Newcastle, Doncaster, Sheffield, and there was just devastation and no new jobs replacing the old industry that Thatcher decided to close. So mm. they were pretty, pretty revolutionary types. The only thing they were too stoned to do anything about it, but the major didn't know it. So they were really worried and I think that criminalization that was underpinned by political concerns. So when you think about it today, John Major is this cuddly old liberal Tory. I mean, he wasn't liberal at all at that time. You know, his government was very authoritarian and petrified that they were losing it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they were losing it because only a few years later, John, uh, you know, John Major lost and Tony Blair won and the whole world has just completely changed politically. We weren't at that moment in time, other than setting up um, James setting up Backspace, which was Arts Hub, which was by definition fairly political in itself. Um, the everybody was so busy. I mean, we were we were just busy. I mean, I I, I made, made yeah, you were right. we, were, we were not making much money, but we were busy. Yeah, there was demand. Everybody wanted a website. Everyone knew, and the project, but just you know, like the the margins were tiny or non-existent. But it was busy. You are, you are very right. You, when, 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 lateral, when lateral started, as it, as it evolved, actually, one of, one of the things I kind of realized was that this working 18 hours a day wasn't good. You know, this, this meant we were badly organized yeah. and actually having to grow up a bit in terms of how we actually did things. Uh, and when, um, when you got interested in the process thinking, because you are kind of master workflow builder, well, we, we, we kind of locked out. We first did Dave Harp, who was ex, um, he was ex Gray. He was an old ad advertising guy. And we, we used to say that Dave was, you know, new school, old media. Uh, and we were old school, new media. Um, and then when Sue Serene joined as well, um, um, and we introduced the concept of trafficking, right, in, internally, which totally changed the way we worked because it meant that everybody knew what they were doing and when, they had to be, when it had to be done for. So whilst um, you had people like um, uh, Glue, uh, Mark Ridge, um, and the Deep End guys, right, and we're, we're doing, you know, they were growing, growing really rapidly. We, it, it took us a little while to actually work out how to organize ourselves in a, in a decent way. Um, but when you imagine today, you know, people take it for granted that we didn't have collaborative team working tools. You yeah. know? So, you had your post-it notes. I don't even know if we have post-it notes. Were post-it yeah. notes? Dan, yeah. Bam, Dan Bambach. Was... We didn't have whiteboards. So I'm mean, just amazed how you managed to organize it. Yeah. Dan Bambach, Laura's husband, who used to work with you at Siberia, he actually wrote for a system for us to, to do time tracking because we couldn't find one mm -hmm. in like 2003 or something. Uh, and it was, uh, it was quite late on. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the tools weren't there. Um, lots of yeah, it, it makes me laugh that you know when you go now to I do lots of big projects now and people say oh you know you need Asana you need teamwork you need something but yes it's great to have it but you know we built projects ten times as big with bits of paper and they were fine on time and on budget you know it's like you don't have to have it it's nice to have it yeah. but it doesn't make your work hard we, we had the big board on the wall big board yes yeah you know uh, that quite well. Um, and yeah, so so it was it was an interesting that, that that sort of after it was only really in '97 when people started paying attention, wasn't it? That um, there was a lot of the people that I spoke to, certainly at, at brands during the obsolete period, um, they 
put the web under IT. It wasn't under marketing. They didn't see it as a marketing thing. They thought it was a computer geeky thing. Um, so I was going and doing pitches in the IT department of businesses. Weird. That was it. That wasn't a good marriage. Yeah, I remember that. Very weird. Um, uh, and it was at the time when I went to Top Shop in 2000, they wanted me to sit in IT, and they were fucking joking. I'm not doing it. So we created this whole separate organization, which we called e-commerce. And I was the first e-commerce director in the UK and probably the first one round word because we just didn't have the concept of it. I knew exactly what it needed to be. So I just pulled the best people from both. But that that was very, very early because they thought, you know, IT is the place where it was. And IT was, you know, looking after post systems in shops. <laughs> they were not about to start exploring media. So in terms of the your view on that first period, so obviously it was quite open, international, uh, very agile, without necessarily agile tools, but agile by definition, um, and, the, and creative, because the quality of concepts, you know, Levi Arts, the, you know, it was amazing work. But can I ask you a question about what you think were the uh, wins from that period? I mean, do you think that our ability to work on open source product, Wikipedia, uh, where would you say were the wins of that period? Um, the, the things that I thought were really exciting, certainly in like 95, 96 actually, was um, we ended up having a big fight with their, the agency Organic in the US. Uh, and they, they were just starting up, they were just starting up around the um, Apache the web server. So they, they were building Apache, Brian Bell and Norton Cliff Skolnick. We had these guys who were building um, computing technology called Zeus. And Zeus was faster, right? It was faster than Apache. And um, and it was just mad. So we had we, we actually had them there. Whenever we wanted to do anything interesting, like I don't know, render fonts dynamically, right? They actually just wrote an engine so that we could actually just do it. I mean, our, of course, our websites didn't work on anything other than Zeus, but <laughs> um, but um, but that, that that moment of massive change yeah, that you could actually see things see things really ha happening. The you know the whole thing going you know, going back and forth to, from the States. And there was a thing called Cyber Organic, which was kind of the techno-pagan lot. And it was, all, it was all really cool. Um, and then dot, 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 Steve Bannon and dot, 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 Trump. I, I mean, I think that, that, that when I say naive, I think there's a lot of stuff that we did um, for good reasons. You know, we, had, we were, you know, the, the road to hell paved with good intentions. Um, yeah, I mean, you worked uh, quite hard with uh, Cyber Salon on getting the Digital Bill of Rights to House of Commons, mm. uh, which we managed to do twice, actually, 2015, and then into Labour Manifesto in 2019. Um, so, I mean, I think this was really great project because we uh, recommended free broadband for all. And at that time, we got slanted to it. But, you know, a few months later, um, COVID came. And so big chunk of millions of kids ended up not being able to learn from home because they didn't have a connection. And it's only now the government is putting some shape of communities, uh, fiber for communities that uh, are targeting broadband for uh, deprived families. But you know, if we did that, if labor won and we did that, that would have been well in place to be delivered. So I think we kind of seen it coming. We just didn't realize it would come a year later. Yeah, but I mean, they, so the. You know, the, the, the creating the tools which basically allowed the things like snoopers starting to happen is one thing, but actually creating the behavior that allowed that allows QAnon and anti-vaxxers um, and the you know the the edge. And I look at it. Um, I think about punk in the '80s, and there's a lot of folk that just went have taken the the sort of epic and gone the wrong direction. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So if every media creates a risk. I remember reading this book, uh, Emergence, and the guy is writing about uh, amplifier, you know, just like what you use on football stadiums to tell people to behave themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a pretty random tag that came about uh, 1920s, was invented in mm -hmm. 1920s. And then what happened, you know, Nazis had the little Nuremberg rallies, and it was only like three people on them because you couldn't have a proper rally without the amplifier. But then they came across the amplifier. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, 
And then the next thing he knew, there were 700,000 people on that stadium and that created that energy that Hitler then captured and draw forward. So, you know, every medium, every generation creates the risks for the humanity. And we take 20 years to figure out what is the risk. So, how, so following from that, so are you on the side of, you know, a lot of people are saying that it's the Wild West is finished. The sheriff needs to be back in time and we need to regulate the shit out of it. Are you on that side or I, do you think I, we should stay open and provide freedom of speech and just work through it? And we have learned from technology is technology can change. And Absolutely. It's like, it's like know, Randy not, Kosman always says, internet party always moves on. Yeah. And maybe yeah. that's what will happen with Facebook because I've seen that you move to Clubhouse and my kids are in TikTok it's, and it's other not, people on the stereo. Oh, is that it's diverge, diverging quite quickly now? I think I think the interesting. I mean, it, it's so funny because if you'd if you'd asked me in '96, I would have said, "Don't regulate anything. It needs to be the Wild West." And it, you know, it's it's not great. We're democratizing communications. You know, this stuff's like, we're taking it back from Murdoch and and uh, Maxwell, actually, I suppose. Um, and now I'm kind of going, hmm, yeah, that worked well, didn't it? <laughs> uh, it's difficult because, you know, we, we are from the making side. You and me were on the making side. So yeah. if you start regulating things too early, they just never happen. Yeah. And, and if you start to privatize them too early, that never happens. You know, I still remember touring um, Xerox Park, I think, in early 90s when I was fundraising for Siberia. And, you know, they had alternative for every tank. They even have alternative for TCPAP. They had their own protocol. And it all worked better, <coughs> more efficient. But because it was privately owned, it never none of us ever took off. And I think that was the problem, that if you start regulating or privatizing or both at the same time, it's just nothing happens. So if you want yeah. something to happen, you have to take your risk. You know the, the guy from who wrote Siberia, uh, Doug, Doug Drashkov? He argues that we just have to push through. Mm -hmm. But you have to push through with reflection. So I think we're very good in pushing through, which is not very good in the reflection. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I, I think with regulate the regulatory thing is that the, the, the Amazons, the Apples, the the Googles, etc. They're global properly. They can make yeah. a decision and yeah. it will happen worldwide. If they want to, right? The regulations are local. Yeah. So right? there are a few steps behind. Yeah. And, incre and increasingly local. And and I, I think we all laughed our asses off with the whole cookie thing, which was basically a non-issue by by the by the time the actual legislation got through, and it was just a pain in the ass. Um, that the you know that problem could have been solved by changing browsers. Frankly, you yeah. know it, it didn't yeah, need, need to happen the way it did. Well, uh, what are you excited about for the internet and for the technology? What are your big bets for the future? So copying and doing virtual platforms. I said I, I, when I when I first got into all the tech stuff in the early eighties, it, it was Gibson. It was reading Burning Chrome and, and Mona Lisa Overdrive. Uh, sorry, um, Neuromancer uh, back, back then, and then Snow Crash later on. And the um, for me, and you know, you know, I'm passionate about this stuff. Um, I think VR is, thanks to the pandemic, is getting a bit closer to becoming more of a sort of mainstream reality. Um, I, f I find the difference between AR and VR very interesting because of and, and, and people tend to use the, the, the terms in the same breath and they shouldn't. Yeah. VR is personal and it's private to an extent. Okay, so Facebook, uh, Facebook spying on you on the Oculus, but, it, but you're, in a, you're in your own house and it, it's that. Whereas augmented AR, augmented reality, the glasses, um, as we know from Google Glass, is a privacy nightmare. Uh, yeah, that didn't land well. I had them, I love them actually, but uh, yeah. So not to be seen in, in the street. So I, I think I think I think we're gonna have I, th I think that that's gonna be where the next big battleground of cool tech cool tech. I think Oculus could go back to being its own thing again. I think some of the sub companies that's easy. But okay, um, we, we need to wrap up because we probably got to the point. So let me just finish up. So John, thank you very much for joining us. It was a privilege, really amazing to walk through your your path so many names that uh, you know i would like to follow on so hopefully we'll get back to the 
next episode where we cover the next 10 years, 2005 to 2015. But thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, good luck with your new adventures. Always, always a pleasure. Thank you.